This video is published by the American College of Radiology's Head Injury Institute. The Head Injury Institute is involved in a wide range of activities relating to traumatic brain injury, including education, standards and tool creation, research, and policy. If you are interested in learning more, please check out our website at www.headinjuryinstitute.org. This video is intended for clinical radiologists who interpret brain imaging, clinicians treating traumatic brain injury patients, and other neuroimagers interested in TBI. After viewing this video, you should be able to identify signs of increased intracranial pressure on imaging, be familiar with objective CT scales, understand the risks and benefits of invasive ICP monitoring, and make estimates of prognosis based on imaging findings to guide interventional decision making. After infancy, the intracranial compartment is a closed space. Thus, any intra- or extra-axial space-occupying lesion, for example, a hematoma, can result in increased pressure within the compartment and lead to mass effect on adjacent normal structures and herniation of structures from their usual locations. Mass effect may also ca be caused by secondary insults, such as cerebral edema and swelling, which contribute significantly to injury after traumatic brain injury. Intracranial pressure is an indirect measure of mass effect, and it has been shown that the average ICP value in the first 48 hours after TBI is an independent predictor of mortality. ICP is typically measured by drilling a calvarial burr hole and placing an intracranial pressure monitor. While such a procedure is invasive and carries significant morbidity, careful ICP monitoring can help determine when the benefit of further surgical intervention might outweigh the risk. The Brain Trauma Foundation specifies that sustained ICP elevation above 20 milligrams of mercury warrants intervention. Indeed, it has been shown that despite the risks of ICP monitors themselves, aggressive monitor placement decreases mortality from 45 to 27 percent. Cross-sectional imaging provides a non-invasive way to assess the intracranial compartment and can help guide the need for invasive ICP monitoring. A few studies have shown that a normal non-contrast CT predicts a low risk of elevated ICP over the hospital course. Eisenberg et al. in 1990 showed that a normal initial CT scan after head trauma had a 91% sensitivity for patients who did not go on to have elevated ICP. In that study, there were four out of a total of 46 patients with normal initial CT scans who later developed a moderate elevation of ICP, though none required aggressive treatment. On the other hand, an abnormal initial CT scan is not as good a predictor of concurrent or future ICP elevation. Miller et al. showed in a paper in the Journal of Trauma in 2004 that only slightly more than half, 53 to 63 percent of patients with abnormal initial CT scans went on to develop intracranial hypertension. Despite the inability for an abnormal scan to predict initial or future ICP, these authors did document a statistical trend towards a linear association between initial CT characteristics, namely ventricular size, sulcal size, transvalsine herniation, gray and white matter differentiation, and the degree of future ICP elevation. This study also confirmed that an important minority of patients with normal initial CT scan do go on to develop intracranial hypertension, and they suggested follow-up imaging be done for such patients, especially in light of the fact that one-third of patients have evolving intracranial injuries. There are two major imaging-based classification systems which attempt to standardize assessments of CT abnormality after head trauma in hopes of predicting outcome. The first was the Marshall criteria, developed in 1992, which were validated in a prospective trial. This study was limited by the inability to classify TBI patients with multiple injury types, and also had inconsistent standards for CT features, such as timing of the scan after injury. The Rotterdam classification system, created in 2005, is an update which seeks to address these previous limitations. However, it has not yet been fully validated and is modeled only on moderate to severe TBI patients based on initial CT imaging. Of note, the Rotterdam classification system 
has higher overall accuracy in predicting mortality as evidenced by higher area under the receiver operator characteristic curve, 0.77, compared to 0.67 achieved by the Marshall criteria. Only one study has attempted to investigate imaging characteristics and ICP. In a retrospective study from 2004, Miller et al. looked at the accuracy of ICP prediction based on five imaging variables from the initial non-contrast study. They found only statistical trends in the ability of imaging characteristics to predict ICP. Briefly summarized here are the Marshall criteria, where classification into six categories is determined based on the presence or absence of the listed criteria, and further subclassification depends on more detailed descriptors listed in the third column. The higher the class, the worse the prognosis. One of the major limitations of the Marshall criteria are that individuals with multiple injuries, such as someone with diffuse injury as well as a large subdural, would be categorized the same as someone with only a large subdural. The Rotterdam classification is simpler and avoids the inability to classify patients with multiple injury types as the system awards points based on degree of abnormality in each of four independent features and then adds these up to determine an overall score which can then be used to predict mortality rate at six months post-injury. The features that the system considers include basal cisterns, midline shift, epidural collection, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now let's look at some examples of imaging characteristics that could inform ICP. This example shows, in the image on your left, a small left convexity epidural hematoma associated with a fracture through the left coronal suture, likely not significantly affecting ICP due to its small size. The image on your right shows a large right subdural hematoma with substantial midline shift effacement of all the sulci and compression of the lateral ventricles. Midline shift and extraaxial collection thickness of more than one centimeter combined with assessment of the patient's clinical status often trigger neurosurgical intervention. This is a 45-year-old man with diffuse acute subarachnoid hemorrhage seen as hyperdensity throughout the sulci. Acute subarachnoid hemorrhage can result in communicating hydrocephalus, which can quickly affect intracranial pressure. Of note, the subarachnoid space is clearly delimited on this example due to the overlying thin subdural hygroma. Serial imaging assessment is important after head trauma due to the temporal evolution of intracranial injuries. The image on your left is the initial CT scan showing several small intraaxial contusions bilaterally, as well as acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Six days later, there was dramatic increase in hemorrhagic component to the bifrontal and bitemporal contusions, corresponding edema and mass effect, likely with concomitant increase in ICP. This CT image shows diffuse cerebral edema, as evidenced by complete effacement of sulci and basal cisterns, resulting in a pseudo-subarachnoid hemorrhage appearance. The loss of the normal gray-white differentiation is clear. Images from an MRI show effects of chronic elevation in ICP. In this patient with a prior history of trauma, we see right convexity subdural hematoma with blood products of varying age. The coronal and axial T2-weighted images show scalloping and enlargement of the olfactory groove. And on axial T2 weighted images, there is flattening of the posterior ocular globe, which would be expected to correspond to papal edema as seen on ophthalmological examination. In the future, quantitative imaging metrics using CT and MR and possibly machine learning techniques may be able to provide a better objective assessment of severity of an intracranial abnormality, ICP, and prognostic implications. MRI is typically used for more long-term applications and milder TBI. 
In summary, overall aggressive ICP monitoring improves mortality after TBI. CT imaging is useful to determine which patients can be spared ICP monitor placement and the concomitant risks. Namely, patients with normal initial non-contrast CT need not have ICP monitor placement, but should be followed with serial scans, as some will develop secondary injuries or evolution of primary injuries. There is limited data using imaging findings to specifically predict ICP. However, imaging characteristics have been shown to inform prognosis. For more information, please consult the following resources. And please let us know how we did.